and gentlemen, the Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy welcomes you to its grand annual offering, a sumptuous week-long banquet of art with the choicest fare from leading artists and contemporary masters. This year being the 100th birth anniversary of the renowned Amrita Shekhar, the Art Week has been dedicated in memory of her contribution to art. It is a privilege to have amongst us Shri K. K. Sharma, the advisor to the administrator, Chandigarh administration, to inaugurate this Art Week. May I request Mr. Divan Manna to welcome you all. As we all know, I don't really need to tell all of you about Amrita Shergil. She was an icon and she was somebody who belonged to this soil. Though she was not born here, but uh, be it Lahore, it was part of us, then she went to Shimla, then now Shimla was also a capital of Punjab, now Chandigarh is the capital of Punjab, so we can somehow claim that she is ours. I welcome Mrs. Anjali Ila Menon, the second time to the Lalit Kala Academy. She's so generous, so kind, that whenever we have requested her, in spite of all the engagements, she always says yes, she never says no to Chandigarh. Thank you so much. And I welcome Shri S. Kalidas, a renowned scholar, writer on art and music, and the son of the great J. Swami Nathanji. Thank you so much for being with us. We thought of this festival long time ago because we wanted to dedicate something to Amrita Shergilji. Now, Chandigarh, as we all know, is a city which has intellectuals, scholars, writers, painters, theatre personalities, all kinds of people who are interested in the arts as such. And then we thought, why not have a festival in which thinkers, writers, curators, critics, historians and artists, they get together and discuss whatever is ailing, whatever is happening in the field of art. So may I request you to please come on stage and formally inaugurate the festival as well as release the catalogue for the Amrita Shergil National Art Week. In our Indian tradition, samskar is believed to be a major determiner of a person's predilections and personality. Veteran art critic, musician, painter and writer S. Kalidas amply bears out this theory. One could say he was born with a paintbrush in his mouth, being the son of the late painter J. Swaminathan. Breathing in an atmosphere of art, he grew up learning classical music from the great masters Pandit Malikarjun Mansur and Ustad Amjad Ali Khan. Kalidas's particular genius lay in writing, however, and steered him towards journalism. He has worked for over three decades in senior editorial positions with major newspapers and magazines, including the Times of India, India Today, The Pioneer, Swagat and Discover India. Besides English, he has mastery in Hindi, Urdu, Bengali and Eskalidas has contributed immensely in documenting on celluloid the Indian art scene. He has conceived and produced programs for ITV India, PTI TV, Doordarshan and Business India Television, along with archival documentation for the Sangeet Natak Academy, Delhi, the Bharat Bhavan Bhopal and IGNCA. His music guru, Pandit Malikarjan Mansoor and Begum Akhtar have been his particular muses, inspiring him to write their biographies and make films on their lives as well. Dwelling on the concept of Ishq and the pain Akhtar suffered as a singer and as a woman, Kalidas brings to her admirers an understanding of how closely her bittersweet music echoed her tumultuous life. His film on Pandit Mansoor won the Golden Lotus at the National Film Awards in 1994. Other well-known books by him include Of Capacities and Containment, Poetry and Politics in the Art of Subodh Gupta, Zarina Hashmi, Radiant Transits, and most recently, Transits of a Whole Timer. This catalogue contextualizes, through its documentary fervor, the years 1950 to 69, the gestational period of S. Kalidas's father, J. Swaminathan's artistic career. 
It offers a peep into the mindscape of the legendary artist as he made the tra transition from being a left-wing political activist to a journalist, critic, artist and publisher of the controversial art magazine Contra and then finally to a full-time artist. Escalidas has twice been a fellow of the Department of Culture, Government of India, lecturing on Indian art and classical music at universities and museums abroad. Today, he shall take us on a reflective journey of decades of transit and then engage in dialogue with Ms. Anjali Ella Menon. We welcome you, sir, and request you to please take the stage. Thank you. I feel awfully privileged to be here today and I must begin by thanking the Lalit Kala Academy Chandigarh, Sri Divan Mannaji, especially for having conceived of this whole program and having invited me here for this week-long celebrations of the iconic Punjabi painter. Amrita Shergil. My presentation here today, however, is not about Amrita Shergil. Instead, I shall talk about an exhibition that I curated a few months ago in Delhi on my late father, Jagdish Swaminathan, 1928 to 1994. Uh, this year, later this year, we hope to expand this exhibition to a full-scale retrospective at the National Gallery of Modern Art. This is, a, uh, this is both an art historical project and also a project that takes me through my li own lifetime. Um, it's personal memory too. The exhibition was titled Transits of a Whole Timer. The title comes from the phrase whole timer, which is used primarily by communist Kada to describe those who give all their time and energy to work for the party. The phrase also plays on the word whole as in complete. This exhibition was a wedge from my father, father's archive. It offered a small window focusing on the highlights of the crucial two decades of his life when he made the transition from a left-wing political activist to a journalist, critic, artist and then to a full-time artist. Through an art historical display, it narrativized his life through vignettes of his autobiographical notes, some early drawings and illustrations and sketches from his exercise books, some family photographs, some letters written to him by his colleagues and friends, his early catalogues and phot photographs of early works, all spanning roughly two decades from 1950 to 1969. And that shall be the subject of my presentation this afternoon too. My father was fond of quoting Gandhiji's famous saying, quote, my life is an indivisible whole. The quote ties up with another of his favorite shlokas from the Isa Upanishad. It's a famous shloka. Purna medaha, purna medam, purna, purna mudichyate, purna masya, purna madaya, purna meva vashishyate. That is whole, this is whole, whole comes from the whole, the whole subtracted from the whole remains whole. Swaminathan, or Swami as he was called, was quite taken by this metaphysical concept of the whole or totality, which is also in a sense the zero or the shunya. This concept came, was very cardinal to his thinking and it came in handy when he mocked the Marxist notions of progress and history. Having been an, a Marxist himself throughout his youth, only he could mock uh, at Marxism with the, with the strength of the Isa Upanishad. Progress, he said, assumes a beginning and thus a creator. 
how can there be progress how can there be progress in infinity he argues in his painting too perhaps by intent he completed the circle as it were by returning to the kind of pictorial imagery towards the end of his life that he had started out doing in the early 50s and 60s so to trace the arc of his oeuvre uh, the exhibition had a few examples of his paintings from the last and most well, more well known stylistic periods of his life unfortunately of his earlier works very few oils and paper works remain and we do have some black and white photographs of those early years some of which i uh, some of them i'll be showing two house numbers are central to swami's life in those years and they were 6 by 17 and 1890 6 by 17 western extension area karol bag was my grandfather's home in delhi after his retirement from government service in 1945 and where we lived between 1956 and 1968 before 1956 my father had been living in the karol bag party office till june 1955 having run away from home and college in 1943 as a boy of 15 he had joined the congress socialist party worked for this uh, worked at the csp office in bada hindu rao in old delhi between 1944 and 1948 and after independence along with many other congress socialists he felt that the congress socialist party was losing its focus gandhi ji if we remember had already asked for the congress to be disbanded by that time and my father felt that uh, along with many other congress socialists that the cpi the csp was losing its focus of the indian revolution and he shifted to the more radical cpi that was being led by bt ranadive at that time the cpi at that time was leading the telangana rebellion telangana is not a, a, a matter just that has come up now it was there in 1948 and the cpi had liberated 10000 acres of agricultural land from the nizam's rezakars and distributed this land among landless peasants my father however balked at the bloodshed and in retrospect he calls btr a megalomaniac he uh, he said and i quote those of us in the delhi party who questioned btr's line were told that the people's army will take care of us when it reached delhi in the first general election of 1952 j swaminathan was very active as a campaigner for the cpi he was also the election agent of vimla kapoor who later became vimla faruqi Uh, who was standing from the karol bag constituency mohit sen the well known communist ideologue describes meeting swaminathan at the cpi office in 1953 with in these words and i quote swaminathan had come to the communist party from the left socialist group led by yadatta narayanan and aruna safali he was a party whole timer in karol bag He was in love with a beautiful young student whose parents were more than somewhat skeptical about his ability to take care of her. He also wondered whether he could combine love with whole timership. His hair was shorter then and he was less disheveled but he was the same swami of later years of fame and self destruction. In those days <coughs> he wrote striking poems that were a blend of mysticism and hymns to revolutionary struggle. more striking than his poems was his sparkling talk the, there was breadth of vision search for knowledge and assertion of conviction he was good at argument and that specially endeared him to me i am happy that i strengthened his resolve both to marry his love and remain a whole time communist in 1955 actually my father met my mother while he was addressing the crowds in the 52 elections she was in the audience Uh, and then and the affair continued for 3 4 years uh, they both came from different communities he was a tamil brahmin she was also a brahmin but from kumau um it took them some 
years to, to get married. Uh, in, in 1955, when Swaminathan married my mother Bhavani Pandey, he had to move out. He had to move out of the party office, and he had no place to take my mother to. Shripad Amrit Dange, the veteran trade unionist and CPI leader, leader, arranged for them to stay for a few months at a sanatorium for workers in the forests of Betul in Madhya Pradesh. There, he had his first experience with tribal life something that impressed him deeply and he was to delve into uh, the tribal arts and uh, tribal social uh, norms later on in life. It was only when my mother was about to give birth to me the next year that my grandfather relented and she and my father were given a room in the family home 6 by 17 Karol Bagh. 6 by 17 WEA is situated on a street of Ajmal Khan Road. It was not a large house, but it was always a full house. It was filled with Swami's siblings, their children, visiting relatives. It was also a very Tamil Brahmin house with festivals, marriages, daily prayers and rituals where my father was largely absent. He appeared only late at night, often quite routinely drunk and high on alcohol. Occasionally, my father's friends would come and stay with us. And uh, especially, I remember Ambadas, Himmat Shah, Jairam Patel, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, they all came and stayed for short visits in that house. The Mexican poet and diplomat Octavio Paz also visited that house. And Swaminathan lived there till 1968 when he could afford to rent a flat of his own in South Extension, in South Delhi. The year that my father moved to, uh, to 6 by 17 WEA was 1956. That was also the year when the Hungarian uprising took place and it was the year of my birth. That year, he resigned from the Communist Party of India to protest against the Soviet takeover of Hungary. And he picked up on his childhood love of painting. Uh, he had been a prolific painter in his school also. He, uh, he, he writes and he used to tell us that all the school walls were full of his uh, drawings and um, portraits of national leaders and so on. He joined the evening classes at the Delhi Polytechnic, which is now the Delhi College of Art. Um, Bhavesh Sanyal was the principal at that time. And he came under the spell of the Bohemian artist teacher Silos Mukherjee. About him, he writes very lyrically in his memoirs. Silos Mukherjee was also the teacher of a whole range of Delhi artists of that period, beginning with Rajesh Mehra, ending with Manjeet Bhava. Arpita Singh, Paramjeet Singh, many, many. Um, the years 56, 57 saw him tentatively doing some sketches and exercises and he made several illustrations for popular Hindi journals and English publications to earn a living and these included some portraits of his family, close friends, some still life studies, landscapes uh, and they are drawn in a variety of styles, some quite openly simulating the styles of a Matisse or a Picasso or even a Ram Kumar. Now, a few of these sketches have survived along with some family photographs from those years and these I call the pictures of love, home, family and friends. May I have the first sequence of slides please. So this was the window fr uh, from his room in 6 by 17. Uh, it's a window looking out. Next. And against the same window, a newborn S. Kalidas is being kept <laughs> entertained by his aunt. Next, um, the, uh, my grandparents, my aunts, um, I'm there too, my brother and my cousins. That's 6 by 17 Karul Bhatt. Next, please. My grandmother, Swaminathan's mother. Next, please. 
his sister dharma and dharma actually lived for chandigarh in for about 15 years she lived in chandigarh the uh, next nirmal verma he is the younger brother of the artist ram kumar a hindi novelist and writer nirmal was uh, swaminathan's closest friends he was also a member of the communist party in the 50s and the 60s later he went to czechoslovakia and was a personal friend of dubček and he was part of the czech uh, uprising and the czech rebellion of 68 next please my father's portrait of my mother from 56 next please an early illustration pen and ink illustration again 56 next please if sketch from 57 well very much ala ram kumar next please a landscape ala bengal school or whatever a stylized landscape in the mode of silos mukherjee that he later made an oil painting which simulates this uh, landscape thank you in 1958 j swaminathan got a scholarship to study at the art uh, to study art in the academy of fine arts in warsaw poland um, jeevan adalja was another indian artist who was also studying there at that time however my father could not complete his two years in poland he got homesick um, and also we ran out of money uh, he returned to india the <coughs> next year in 1959 but very soon in 1960 he had his first public showing with two other delhi artists narendra dikshit and pyare krishan rasdan that is the academy of arts in warsaw poland as it is today next please that is him in the winter of 1958 in warsaw in front of his hostel next please the, uh, with his friend jeevan adalja in their room in the hostel in warsaw next please his first catalog of his first exhibition um, three self portraits swaminathan rasdan dikshit next please close up of the his self portrait from 1960 next please narendra dikshit and swaminathan in front of c55 uh, sorry 6 by 17 crore work thanks between 1960 and 64 swaminathan had six exhibitions in delhi and mumbai three were solo shows and three <coughs> three were group shows his style was also constantly changing and evolving through these years from the cave or rock painting inspired paintings of bison and cattle to tantra inspired canvases of yoni and shunya he tried to root his modernist idiom in the indian tradition this is a work from 63 it is now in switzerland uh, with uh, the daughter of uh, rashna imhasli who who uh, who who is the daughter of keku gandhi who used to who used to run the kemol art gallery in delhi and bombay at that time and uh, my father writes that he was perhaps the first to introduce tantric symbolism to modern art long before birende and raza did it they did it about nearly uh, de- birende did it a decade later and raza of course 15 to 20 years later but uh, my father did it only for a very short brief he did it only for two or three years uh, and uh, these works uh, are very hardly seen in india anymore <coughs> this work was called the yoni and the shunya series next please this work is in the collection of uh, the writer philosopher mukund lat in jaipur it's a watercolor again um, vaguely using tantric symbols next piece this work was bought by the by pradosh das gupta who was the uh, i think the second director of the national gallery of modern art for his personal collection it is now with their sons again a neo tantric work of from 63 thank you writing about the early 60s uh, and i quote from my father's autobiographical notes uh, he writes 
The famous teacher and artist Birende had just returned from USA after finishing his Rockefeller Fellowship. He held at that time that abstract expressionism was the last word in painting. Now we were getting a little fed up with this kind of nonsense. We had already heard that Sayyid Haider Raza and Akbar Padamse were talking about centrality of the school of Paris. Satish Guzral was fulminating against easel painting itself upholding that mural art was the only real thing after his study in Mexico and now New York was being added to that list. Some of us thought that it was time to call a halt to such nonsense and rethink on the situation. I met Jairam Patel, Ambadas, about this time and we talked and talked, mulling things over glasses of chai, rum or beer, what we, whatever we could get at that time. We talked and corresponded with other artists, notably Rajesh Mehra, Gulam Sheikh, Jyoti Bhatt and Raghav Kaneria. And after several meetings, ultimately, we met at Bhavnagar, Gujarat, in the house of Jyoti and Jayanth Pandya, formally to launch the group 1890 in August 1962. 1890 did not mean anything. It was just the number of the house where Jyoti and Jayanth lived. Group 1890 held its first and only show in October 1963. It was inaugurated by Jawaharlal Nehru and introduced by Octavio Paz. J. Swaminathan wrote the manifesto for the group. You know, having been a communist, he had to write manifestos, of course. So he wrote a manifesto for the group. Introducing the group, the then Mexican ambassador and poet Octavio Paz has written, these young men make me think of those adolescents who run away from their homes, moved by an irresistible impulse. They don't know where they are going, but they know that someone, somewhere, something awaits them. Call it love, death, art, truth, fraternity, self-knowledge, unity with the absolute, revolution, revolt, revolution. These young men hear the marvelous call. They rise and abandon their family, their gods, their native towns without looking back. They go in search of the encounter. There were a couple of occasions in the mid-60s when attempts were made to hold more joint exhibitions of group, group 1890, but logistics and divergent individual life paths prevented them from happening. Swaminathan himself probably had become indifferent to the idea of the group itself. For him, perhaps, the 1890 moment was over. Even if the movement to acquire a national identity on the stage of international modernism was very much on. That was the, um, the catalogue of Group 1890 exhibition. Next, please. That was the manifesto. Next, please. And that's a picture taken by a very uh, important photographer called Kishore Parekh. His son, Sandeep uh, Parekh, is in Bombay now. Kishore Parekh was the, uh, was the chief photographer of the Hindustan Times, under whom Raghu Rai trained. So this is all the members of the group 1890 at Kutub Minar in 1961. Next, please. The inauguration of 1890. I am offering the rose to Nehru. Next, please. Uh, Raghav Kaneria sculpture, my father Raghav Kaneria and my younger brother Harsha. Next please. Uh, my father's portrait again from 63 by Kishore Parik. Thank you. Nationhood and identity. These two decades, 1950 to 1970, were not only seminal to what is now somewhat easily called Nehruvian modernism, but also to Swami's own becoming and his oeuvre. These were decades when, he, uh, when his often contrarian polemic and his rapidly evolving art practice were beginning to impact the Indian art, art scene and as a self-proclaimed stormy petrel in a heady and tempestuous binge, he was set uh, on taking the Indian art scene on. The stormy petrel is a, the petrel is a small bird that that rages against the tempest. Uh, it is from um, from a 1901 poem by Maxim Gorky, the song of the stormy petrel. 
it was Lenin's favorite poem. Lenin called it the battle anthem of the Revol Russian Revolution. And it's interesting that even in the late 60s, my father is comparing himself to the stormy petrel, that someone who is small but taking, um, taking a stand against the tide as it were. Uh, he felt deeply the need to modernize on one hand, but yet rejected the Western model. And that was the lead motive of, of pretty much the Indian scene in, that, in those decades. We were getting modernized, but there was this very strong sense of nationalism, which continued after the independence movement through the 50s and the 60s. So there was also a rejection of West. In Swaminathan's view, in art, this could only be done by rejecting both the Bengal school and the Bombay progressives. He called it clearing the field of scrub before painting it, uh, planting it anew. He went about it with an aggressive passion and an acrimonious anguish that in retrospect prompts a critic like Geeta Kapoor to describe him as a commissar in camouflage. He has himself confessed, and I quote, if I had an artist's scruples in politics, I perhaps brought something of a revolutionary's ruthlessness into art. Quarreling, contradicting myself, blowing hot and cold at the same time, I have enjoyed it all these past years." Unquote. In the high noon of Nehruvian era, a sense of modern Indian nationhood was being forged. And for Swaminathan, that identity, that identity howsoever, howsoever problematic, amorphous, was still important. The manifesto of the group 1890, in the manifesto of the group 1890, he proclaims, from the early beginnings of the, in the vulgar naturalism of Ra Raja Ravi Verma and the pastoral idealism of Bengal school, down through the hybrid minorisms resulting from the imposition of concepts evolved by successive modern Western movements, torture, tortured alternately by memories of a glorious past born out of a sense of futility in the face of a dynamic present, the urge to catch up with the times. Modern Indian art, I'm afraid, by and large, has been inhibited by a self-defeating purposiveness in its attempts at establishing an identity. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting problem. At one level, we are trying to internationalize. On the other level, we want to assert our identity. You can't have both. So that was the problem of that generation. Swaminathan was acutely aware, aware that India was born as a nation state too late. The concept of the nation state, as we know, was developed in the West between the two world wars, between 1916 and 1945. He was aware that India was born at a time when the very concept of the nation state had become obsolete. He saw that the consequences of technology were going to be global. It is interesting that nearly half a century later, in what is now seen and perceived as a widely post-globalized art world, the question of national identity still rankles. Only last year, at the Hong Kong Art Fair, the brash big boy of international curatorial practice, Hans Ulrich Obrist, ask the question, where is the original idea or thought that contemporary India brings to the global table? Clement Greenberg, the American critic who visited India in 1967, had made a similar observation when he commented that Indian art had very little that was worth exporting to the international scene. After vehement, vehemently quarreling with Greenberg in person, Swaminathan gleefully agreed with him in print. In an article titled New Promise, he wrote, the concept of exportability in art pronounced by the American critic Clement Greenberg has more to it than credited by most people here. While the term smacks of commercialism, it, its meaning is far from being so. What Gre Greenberg meant was the exclusive character of a country's art, which makes it acceptable as a, as a distinct contribution to world art and can therefore be ex exported or presented abroad. It is in this sense that Greenberg found the Indian effort generally lacking. 
after taking a hard look at both the Indian and the international art scene in that article, Swaminathan goes on to assert that it is in this context that the strivings of the new painters of the 60s in India becomes relevant. There is a perceptible shift in Indian modern movement. We are perhaps on the threshold of, threshold of a meaningful upsurge among the artists working in significant directions away from the false mo modernism of the previous decades are names like Ambadas, Jairam Patel, Himmat Shah, Rajesh Mehra, Bhupen Khakkar, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, Jyoti Bhatt, Raghav Kaneria, Vivan Sundaram and K.C. Panikar to name a few. In the, classic, in the classic modernist manner, Swami was bluntly challenging the false modernism of what came before his time to make space for the next generation of indigenously nurtured modernist expression. He could be cre credited for being relentless in that pursuit. One year before, before Greenberg's visit in 1966, Swaminathan had started a small journal called Contra 66. Of course, it had to be Contra, it had to contradict everything. So he called it Contra 66. Amongst the contributors were Philip Rawson, M. F. Hussain, Sham Lal, Ram Kumar, Andre Breton, John Cage, Anil Sari, Jairam Patel, Giv Patel and Octavio Paz. Each issue came with an original signed Lino cut and three uh, issues had prints by Himmat Shah, Rajesh Mehra and Gulam Mohammad Sheikh and the last one had uh, one by J. Swaminathan. He writes in his autobiographical notes, on Octavio's pro prompting, I started an art, I started an art journal called Contra, <coughs> which was short-lived but highly controversial. Many leading artists who had subscribed to it did not like the criticism, criticism poked at their work and one day, in a specially arranged luncheon meeting, they gave me the drubbing of my life. They said, I cannot use their money to debunk them. And anyway, I had no right to both paint and write at, these, at the same time. It was unethical. Brothers, I said, I will close the journal down, and I did. But the battle for painting was on, and who can deny the emergent force of uh, an emergent force placed under the sun anyway? Contra 66 was an important station in Swaminathan's transit, and I included all the four issues and some letters that it generated in this show. A year before, Octavio Paz had already written a poem on my father, titled to the painter Swaminathan for his exhibition catalog. So this is Contra 66 issue. It's a highly minimalistic design. Uh, I think the design was by Jairam Patel, if I'm not wrong. Next, please. And these are the four Lino cuts that came with it. This, this one is by Himmat Shah. This one is by Rajesh Mehra, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh. This is a letter that Bal Chavda from Bombay wrote um, to, uh, with, a, with a pen portrait sketch of Swami on the left. Next, please. Geeta Kapoor, November 30, 66. Swami, I am leaving my subscription money for six months. Very honestly, that's all I can afford at the moment. I sent my last copy to Vivan. Would you keep one for me and leave it at Kunika? The article I owed you, could you call me? Have an, I have an explanation. Thanks, Geeta. Next, please. Krishan Khanna, saying that he was sending him 72 rupees. Next, please. Vivan Sundram had, uh, when Contra closed down, Vivan had reached London. He had got his uh, Royal College scholarship. So he sent a Paul Clay uh, card, and the uh, image there is called They Are Biting. It's a painting by Paul Clay. It's a fisherman who's uh, uh, fishing. Next, please. That's Vivan's card to Swami. Swami, don't let them. They are biting. Send me the mag. Gita will give you the money about London later. <coughs> Next, please. That was his catalog of 1965 where Octavio wrote the poem on him uh, and the photograph by uh, Kishore Parekh. Thank you. After Contra 66 folded up, 
Swaminathan rejoined journalism for a short while, only a few month, he, months. He joined Aruna Asafali's uh, United India Periodicals as the editor of the Hindi Patriot. At 700 rupees, the salary seemed good. Then in August 1968, the Soviets marched into Czechoslovakia. And Swami had to resign again because the, Petro the Patriot as a policy supported the Soviet Union. Within a couple of months, luckily, however, in the winter of 68, he was awarded the newly instituted Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship. During the fellowship, he toured the remote regions of Kinnor in Himachal Pradesh, Bastar in Madhya Pradesh and Kutch in Gujarat to extensively search for what he called the traditional Newman. After Betul of 1955, this was his second and more studied and extensive encounter with tribal and pastoral peoples of India. The plight of these indigenous people in free and democratic India moved him deeply. And amongst his papers, there is a handwritten note written in 69, where he laments, What is the price that civilization extracts from the so-called backward communities for the dubious benefits it forces upon them? Everywhere, except for pockets where they have been able to offer organized resistance, the tribal and the pastoral communities in India have been subjected to the most ruthless exploitation by the onward march of money economy. Free and democratic India has not been able to defend and safeguard the lives and cultures of these children of nature. Their steady ruination at the hands of the sahukar or the contractor makes a terrible tale of human suffering and woe. He ends the note with an ominous prediction that anticipates the Maoist upsurge of today. He writes, from the Nagas in the northeast to the Bheels in Madhya Pradesh and parts of Maharashtra, we have an almost unbroken continuous be tribal belt extending over six states of modern India. Naxalbadi and Sri Kakulam are early warnings. They happened in 68 of what could develop into a raging forest fire if our socialistically oriented government does not take heed. The tribal and the pastoral communities in India are too numerous to be liquidated in the natural process of economic evolution. If the, a rigorous policy of protection from the depredation of money economy is not pursued, these people may well become the spearhead for a prolonged and bloody civil war." Unquote. He saw that coming in 68 and, he, uh, and I'm sure uh, the form I found this note in was that I'm sure he must have shared it with Mrs. Gandhi whom he knew well. This deep empathy with the tribal and the pastoral communities lasted for the rest of his life. In 82, he was asked by Arjun Singh's government in Madhya Pradesh to come to Bhopal and set up the Bharat Bhavan where he juxtaposed folk and tribal art with the best modern Indian art. His understanding of the term contemporary was almost literal, encompassing all that existed under the sun at the same time. 69 was also the year when Swaminathan was asked, was invited to serve on the international jury of the San Paolo Biennale, the second oldest Biennale after Venice. It was also the first work. The year before, he had been awarded the honor an honorable mention at the first Renal of India, no longer quite the revolutionary, though still very politically combative. J. Swaminathan by, was, by 1970, confidently negotiating the turbulent currents of the Indian art world, the last slide. This was a phase that, uh, that he called the color geometry of space, <coughs> where, uh, which is almost minimalistic and where he uh, used geometry and color. Next, please. Next, please. That's a postcard from Octavio appreciating that phase of painting, the color geometry of space. Uh, ne next sequence, please. The seventh one. Yeah, that is the card that. Uh, oh, in, on the new year, uh, new year of 1970, Gulam Mohammad Sheikh makes a collage and sends it to J. Swaminathan, who has just returned from San Paolo. So he depicts Swaminathan planting the flag of India in, in Brazilian soil. The next slide, please. And by that, uh, by that 1970, uh, Swaminathan arrives at his most 
well-known and iconic phase of painting which he called the bird tree and mountain. Actually, there's an interesting story here with Anjali and Abhinan sitting here, I would like to recall that uh, these years in uh, between 1890 and 1970, that is 1963 to 1970, were very very difficult years for him because he was no longer interested in doing journalism, so he, he was not earning much money and of course it, in those years there was very little uh, money in art. And uh, um, um, he was trying various things and he was looking for jobs and a much senior Pupul Jaikar and a little junior Anjali Elabin and both found him jobs, one at Lovedale and the other at Rishi Valley. He went to Rishi Valley and uh, Anjali Ji had also arranged for him to get a job at Lafay. But somehow we were all told that he will come back and he will take us because he was joining this boarding school as an art teacher. But something happened on the way and he decided not to. Uh, what happened on the way was that uh, he probably got drunk and high and he saw this wonderful landscape between Northern Karnataka and Southern Maharashtra with those wonderful outcrops of rocks and birds, you know, flying up along those rocks and they stayed in his mind and he started this series of paintings called Bird Tree Mountain, which, which became a hit, he no longer had to work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kalidas Ji. We are, we are not talking about moments, you know, in today's fast food world, when we talk about minutes and everybody wants everything instantaneously, we are talking of, you know, not days or months or years, we are talking of decades. Professor Goswami is sitting amongst us, more than 60 years of contribution to the field of art. Anjali ji, almost 60 years of contribution. We are looking at the history of Indian art. Kalidas ji, who have seen it all, it's, it's, it's a not painting alone, but a young, younger generation. You have to be a thinker. You have to be politically, socially you know, alert and aware. That is what is needed. That is what is the purpose behind this, this whole art week. <laughs>